of the Open Meeting Law, General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 18. This meeting of the Board of Health is being conducted via remote participation. Um, I will have a roll call to make sure everybody's video and audio is working. So, Tim. Here. Are you here, Tim? Here. Steve. George. Here. Maureen. <laughs> Present. John. Here. Oh, I don't. Oh, there you are. Hi, John. And Emma. And Emma will, we will, I will introduce Emma Dragon in a minute and then she'll talk to us later. Um, this meeting is being recorded to the web and could be shown on Amherst Media and broadcast on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. Um, I am now calling the meeting to order. So it's first order. Do you just want to say hello, Emma? And then during new business, you can introduce yourself fully. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. My name is Emma Dragon. I am feel privileged to be able to step into the role as the public health director after Julie Betterman's long tenure. Um, and just thank you so much for, for welcoming me. Welcome. And Jen Brown, are you still there listening? Well, if Jen isn't, I just want to thank her very much for filling in the role for the past two months and doing a yeoman's job, doing director and, and a public health nurse. Okay, so the first order on our meeting, on our meeting are our minutes of the last two meetings, the 8th and then our meeting of the 15th. Does anyone have any comments? There's one correction on the, uh, the October 8th. Uh, you remember I was ejected from the meeting, not because of my bad behavior, but because of a power outage. <laughs> and I had to, and uh, Nancy helped me, you know, I missed about the last 20 minutes of the meeting. So I got the notes from Nancy, but I put the time wrong. I knew it was at the top of the hour because of when I was able to get back on, but I said six o'clock. It's actually seven o'clock the meeting was. That's right. Okay. And I don't know if it was exactly, if somebody remembers exactly, you can add something, but seven o'clock sounds good. Yes. Thank okay. you for picking up on that. Oh, okay, good. Can I have a motion to accept the minutes as amended with the time? I move we accept the minutes from October 8th as amended. S second? Second that. Okay, Maureen. Okay, all in favor. John? Aye. Tim? Aye. Steve? Aye. Maureen? Aye. And Nancy, aye. So unanimous. And then our October 15th meeting for the variants. I didn't see any errors on that. And it was 544. You got that down to the that one. I, that one, I, I made it right <laughs> to the end of that one. No power outage. <laughs> Look good to me. Yes. Okay, may I have a, a motion to accept? I move we accept the minutes of October 15th. <laughs> okay, John, thank you. Second? I can second it. Okay, Tim. Okay, all in favor. Are you in favor of the minute, uh, accepting the minutes? Can you hear me, Tim? Uh -oh. oh, it it was breaking, you know. So, can you repeat that? Can, well, uh, I'm I'm getting a vote for accepting the minutes. Aye. Yeah. Are, uh, Steve. Aye. Maureen. Aye. John, did I get you for this one already? No, but I'll okay. say aye. <laughs> John, I, <laughs> Can you accept the minutes? Yes, I. <laughs> and, and Nancy, yes. Okay. They're, they're all accepted. Huh. Okay. 
Emma's well, going to find Emma, Emma's going to find these our meetings very boring. I think compared to what she's used to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, this is great. <laughs> so next on the agenda is old business smoking regulations. And did you all get my email that DJ can come to our December 10th meeting? Uh, DJ Wilson from the Massachusetts Association of Boards of Health. Yes. Yes. Okay. So Maureen, I'll turn it over to you for the work you've been doing. Well, given the fact that DJ is going to come to the next meeting, I don't think I did that much, but I did get also the um, template that you forwarded from DJ right. and compared that with our current um, regulations and also the ones that I edited to kind of update some of the definitions and terms. And there's some slight differences in definitions, et cetera, but I think we can focus on that at the end of this process more than at the beginning to just see what we need for that. And I would just refer you all to the first page of that template that lists some of the additional steps that we might consider taking. I don't know if any you all had a chance to look at that, but it, I can read them quickly. It's like places that aren't covered by the state, we might consider um, regulating for um, secondhand smoke and smoking bars. Right. Adult, with some of these we've already done, the adult only retail tobacco stores municipal buildings, just as a reinforcement. Do we wanna change the buffer zones around the buildings where smoking is not allowed? Do we wanna extend the parks and playgrounds, athletic fields, recreational areas? Um, the question of the membership clubs, I don't really know which ones we have in town and what's happening with those. Um, nursing homes we've already done whether we want to extend the uh, totally banned smoking in hotels, motels, and bed and breakfast. We ha currently have a 50% of the rooms need to be smoke free. I actually did look online and most, uh, there are only two hotels really in Amherst. One is on earth if we count UMass three and all of them are totally smoke free. And the Airbnbs, if they mention anything, tend to have no smoking inside. Um, so it, it, that kind of a regulation, I don't think would cause anyone any distress. Um, we already have the outdoor restaurant bars. Um, the one thing, another one is the public transportation, bus, taxi waiting areas. So I did look at what some other towns are doing. Um, a lot of them were, it's a mixed bag of who's updated and who's not. And some of these go back a long way, it seems. I, I found some that had smoking positions that were designated. Like if you were hired to a job, it was gonna be one that you were gonna be exposed to smoke. Um, but anyway, that's historic, I think. Um, Northampton is up to date on this as we, we know, we have seen that. But I did notice that, um, in, 19, in 2019, they um, also considered a, a banning cigarette smoking or smoking on the, in the downtown area in general. And that was brought up at one of their meetings and I think it was tabled really. There was a lot of pushback as um, there was concern about its enforcement and its effect on people who um, are unsheltered and it, it seemed punitive to that one particular group. So I think they just didn't do that. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else. I saw one of the towns, they had a large uh, area out of buffer zone outside their public buildings at like 400 feet. And that made me think of what, I don't even remember which street it is, but the one near the high school, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Mattoon Street, I think it is. Well, it's or not no, that it's, where everybody's smoking. No, it's that, one that, it's, it's that one they call Smoking Alley that goes to Gray 
the yeah, back of Grace. Yeah, on the east side. But yeah. it's something just to consider. And I guess I also wondered, is there, have there been any um, complaints, concerns, um, you know, that have been, that people have brought to the town or the Board of Health? Um, and I guess in my thinking about this, I, I thought, well, you know, what about like um, conservation areas owned by the town? You know, it's unlikely that a significant secondhand smoke issue would come up in that setting. You know, there are issues of non-health issues, perhaps of, of littering and uh, fire safety, or I don't know, but I, I guess it's just thinking about some of those areas. Um, the only place I go regularly that's something like that is Mount Pollux. And I often see people smoking in their cars. What they're smoking in their cars, I don't really know. But um, there's, they've come, it, it's almost like people come there to take a smoking break and look at the view, um, like, like nine o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning even. Um, I don't know, just, just some things to think about, I think at this point, and then we can hear from DJ and, and to look at, look at that template before he comes might be a helpful thing to do. Well, thank Any? you, Maureen. You're welcome. I, I, I agree with you, um, uh, especially the extended parks and playgrounds. And I don't see Jen Brown on here, but I think in September, someone called her about smoking in town parking lots. So I don't know. And I don't know, Emma, if you can bring it up at a, a meeting with Paul Bockelman, what the feeling is on extending the buffer zone around buildings and town-owned parking lots for smoking. Um, other comments? One thing we might want to do is update the references. There, uh, There's some newer, I, I did a quick search. I could, I'm glad to do that unless you already did, Maureen. I did look at that a little bit, but I'd yeah. be happy to have you I'll, look at that because I, I am not sure which journals in this yeah. field are ones to look to, but I think, I think there are a couple of things that I came across. One is something called third hand smoke, oh. which is like yes. you go into the, like a, a hotel smoking room. And even though nobody's smoking there now, you know that this is the smoking room. And so those vapors and, and uh, chemicals are still dangerous to someone working there. So that, that's the kind of argument for perhaps saying that we shouldn't have smoking in yeah. uh -huh. any hotels or bed and breakfasts or, or the like. Um, yeah. That was interesting. Um, there's, there's enough of, uh, new information about vaping, secondhand vaping, we should yeah. probably add. Yeah. Um, and I forgot the other area that I was thinking about, but those were two that I noticed. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, and just updating some of some of the others. If I looked at to the CDC website, or they seem to go back still to those older uh, references. Yeah, PubMed has some good ones that look quite legitimate. Just uh, no, not making any new point, but just, just yeah, just updating. Time. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll send you a couple. Sure. So we should also stress smoking and vaping. Also, um, a week and a half ago was the annual American Public Health Association meetings and they were um, virtual. And I, them. I went to a lot of tobacco and uh, uh, meetings and I, could, I asked a couple questions, but in all the presentations, they kept saying, look to Massachusetts. Massachusetts <laughs> is the lead in the US for all the regulations. So uh, as far as selling tobacco products, we were being referred to. And um, it kept being mentioned that town by town, uh, Massachusetts is, is is the place to look for all the regulations. So I got nothing out of any of those meetings except, <laughs> can, can you send us 
your regulations when you write them. We'd like them. Mm. Nancy, so Ed, Ed, what Ed, we're going to do is Nancy. Ed had his hand up. Ed, we don't recognize Ed. Oh. Oh wait a minute. I panelists. Where is Ed? I, oh, Ed Smith. I, there you go. Okay. There you go, Ed. Okay. Thank you. I did want to just throw out that. Um, oh, sorry. We don't have too many complaints for smoking on the street or in the parking lots. The ones that. Um, are some of the hardest ones to deal with are secondhand smoke in multi-unit buildings. Yes. Um, and many buildings have taken an official, you know, no smoking policy, which certainly helps, but there seem to be a lot of people who think that smoking marijuana is different than smoking cigarettes, and it's not all smoking for them. Um, and the other thing is when they can't smoke inside and they're still smoking close enough to the building, and we get infiltration through windows, people who can't open windows or doors because the smokers are far enough from the building, but the smoke ends up in their unit. Um, so those are those are thorny things for us to try to help occupants and managers with. Yeah, and that's another set of regulations that we have. Most of the regulations I looked at, I don't know if that's under a housing consideration. It just didn't seem to be there. I think that HUD housing there's, has there's gone. A third set of, there's a third set of our town regulations on multi-unit dwelling mm -hmm. that would be the next we'll look at. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, in the, they're on the website and they're old as old too. I mean, not, re, not revised. Mm -hmm. And so, Ed, if when we start working on those, if you can give us any guidance, um, that would help you too. I'd be happy to try. Okay. So when, when we get these done, then that's the next set of- We're not done yet. Related. No, there are three of them. <laughs> Hopefully the, the other, this and the next one will go much quicker than our uh, selling tobacco products. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Okay, so we'll leave it that we will review the template and be ready for DJ. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. Our next old business is the mask order and with the idea of discussing masks required on school property because I believe it was Jen Brown had gotten a complaint that college kids were going and using basketball courts at schools and smoking in, I don't know whether it was off hours or on hours or whether the, the schools I haven't been opened but they have been staff at the schools. Have you heard anything, Emma? Well, in terms of hearing about them going, students going onto school property and smoking, no. However, with the new mask order that's in effect as of last week, week. Um, school property would be considered public property. So therefore, mask wearing is inferred. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll just leave that the order as is without adding anything to it. I had a question about that, uh, Nancy. So, you know, the town very quickly, they commendably put up signs all around the downtown area showing our uh, mask area. However, those signs are perhaps a little bit misleading now since there is a statewide order for everybody outdoors, no matter where. And if somebody sees that, it might give them permission to think that they don't have to use the mask except in that area, which is not true. I mean, it's asking a lot to take down all those nice signs, but don't you think it is a little confusing mm -hmm. to have that, to have a town mask area where the state law supersedes and it covers the whole state? Yeah. I know that, 
Um, I know that the town was ordering more signs so they could put them kind of throughout town in areas. I can certainly, I certainly hear you, <laughs> Mr. George, um, in terms of the, that can miss messaging. Um, I, I know that for myself, I feel like public health messaging and outreach and communication is very important in order to get the public the behaviors that we want to see in our public, the only way to possibly get to that point is to, is to meet them where they're at, right? Um, so I know that I've had been in discussions with Brianna in terms of how to strategize with that, as well as the um, Angela and Jen Moylston to really try and problem solve that to make it more streamlined. So an answer for the signs, I think more signs are coming. <laughs> But hopefully we'll be able to, I mean, there's been so many things that have come up on my week one, um, yeah. <laughs> but other things needed more attention. So more to come with that. Okay. Emma, do you think adding uh, an amendment to our mask order, including, um, what did I write here? Of course, I, I have all these papers, including school property would be helpful or just leave it as is? It doesn't seem necessary to me. Yeah. Or to refer to, because it seems obsolete now, you know, because now the Massachusetts um, advisory is to wear a mask in all public places. It's not advisory, it's the law, you know. It's, it's the law, sorry, regulation <laughs> law. Yeah. Um, should we amend ours to match that or no, no. it just I don't think so. I think it just kind of sunsets yeah that's the way I view it is that now that there's state regulation however yeah. if there's a time when state regulation is lifted I think yeah. that would yeah. be a great time to address it but if the yeah. if the board wants to amend it now with that language I will support what the board wants to do. So we're just going to let the state orders supersede our mask order and wait and see what happens. And yes. you'll let us know their complaint. I'm in the signs. <laughs> well, maybe, you we, know, put a sticker over it says in all public. Uh, this way. It, it's a changing landscape, so you got to communicate on the web and news and orally. And uh, I think we address our local order when the state order no longer covers it. If, if we decide we want to rescind our local order at the same time the state does, then we can. Or if we want to leave it when the state does, we can leave it. So. Mm -hmm. OK, so that's, that's right. what we will do. New business introducing emma dragon and we have to make her an agent of the board of health right so, so emma yeah oh sorry you're hearing the classic zoom interjection of the dog dog <laughs> scratching that's ellie um, so I'm Emma Dragon. I'm a nurse and a mom and a local community member. I live in Hadley. I have three children and a lovely uh, spouse named Kyle. Um, I've been a nurse since 2007. I moved back in the area in 2011, which I've worked at Cooley Dickinson since then, that time in a, numerous different areas, emergency medicine, behavioral health, and case management. I was active on the nursing uh, committee there for the MNA in a leadership role, um, helping drive policies and make sure that the nurses' voices were heard. And I'm also a member on the Hadley Board of Health um, and have been doing that since 2018. And so, uh, uh, Stephen, our, our meetings are also quite fun as well. So um, that's why I <laughs> snickered a little bit when you said that earlier. Uh, I have my graduate degree in emergency and disaster management. I've been on many federal deployments, both for disaster relief, but also congressional events. 
Um, and I've been doing that since 2009. So I've kind of been evolving into public health in the last couple of years and um, really enjoyed it the more that I learned about it. And I'm really happy to be able to kind of continue that journey here with Amherst. I could not, I am blown away by the amount of work that Jen Brown has done in the interim, both with keeping up with Maven, doing her contact tracing and all of the normal public health nurse studies, but then all of the work that she's done helping write policies and agreements with Craig's Place and other things that have come up. I just, she's really stepped into that role hugely and I'm just very thankful for her and Nancy Schroeder for a warm welcome. And I'm really excited for where things are gonna go. Oh, and Mary Beth Ogolowitz with her work with the shelter as well and kind of helping out as needed. So good stuff. Does anyone have questions for Emma? Well, welcome. And any way we can help you and work Should all together for the health of Amherst residents. Should yeah. Should we introduce ourselves to Emma? This is true. Yes, we should. <laughs> Start, John. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Hello, Emma. Welcome to the your job, a challenging one. Thanks for taking it on for our town. Uh, my name is John Tobias, and I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Massachusetts uh, and head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And I'm an environmental engineer by, by trade, mostly drinking water stuff, uh, and uh, so that's been my interest related to public health because ultimately that's what environmental engineering is about. Um, and uh, been on the board uh, for a bit. Uh, so actually I think I'm extended on the board. <laughs> I, think I, I think I'm in, a, in for an extra bin here at the moment, but uh, anyway, see what happens next, uh, next year. Okay, Steve. Okay, uh, Emma, I'm Steve George. I'm uh, retired from full-time work at Amherst College where I was a professor in biology and neuroscience. So I'm a neurobiologist. And I don't have any real public health qualifications, but I'm just interested in the work of the board. And uh, so I'm just kind of here because of that. And of course, you know, as you probably know, we get on the board in a different way from how people get on the board in Hadley. And so who knows how, whether I would be here if we had the same situation as Hadley, but I'm happy to be on the board. <laughs> Maureen? Hi, I'm <coughs> Maureen Malay, and I'm a um, retired physician. I practice, <coughs> I got a cough right now, <coughs> um, medicine in the Valley from since 1981. Um, initially in various internal medicine practice positions, but really for the last 20 years of my career at Mount Holyoke College. And in that position, it really moved into both, you know, caring for the individual student, but also a real public health role, um, especially as various infectious diseases or even smoking on campus and all of these things came up. Um, and that sort of piqued my interest in public health. Um, and when asked to serve on this, if I wanted, was interested in applying, I, um, I said yes about two years ago, I think, a year and a half ago. Um, no, I said just, just over a year, maybe. I, I don't actually remember now. Uh, must have been 2019 because I retired at the end of 2018. So, welcome. I noticed your letter along with some other nurses from Cooley Dickinson Hospital and uh, in the paper recently and supported that. <laughs> Yes. Tim? Hello, Emma. This, uh, my name is Timothy Randir. I'm a professor in, at UMass. Um, I specialize in environmental sciences, especially watershed science and hydrology, that type of areas uh, uh, related to water quality. And yeah, I, I, I actually joined the board along with Maureen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, do you have any questions for any of us? Nancy, you got to give your Emma. little, you, Nancy, you oh, got yeah, to you, you yeah, give your yeah, bio. I've been on the board since, oh God, I was off for about 18 months and then I was back on. I predated Julie's 
directorship. I was here under Epi Bodhi. Um, I have my area, I'm a nurse. My areas of expertise have been gerontology, community home health, and public health. Um, I've taught public health nursing from 2001 to 2011 at um, Elms College. And then I've done clinical for UMass from 2011 until 2000 through 2019. Um, I guess that's about it. So do you have any questions for us, Emma? Um, I don't think I have any questions right now, but I'm just really excited to be here in the room, see how your board works. Um, I really am encouraged to have a collaborative relationship with the Board of Health as this role as the health agent for the board. Um, and building on the great uh, foundation that has been experienced historically and, and see the good things that we're going to be able to be successful on moving forward. So that's all I have. Okay. So I just thought of, Nancy, I just thought of one thing I should mention, I think too about myself. So I, I mean, and that, that you may intersect with. So in my role at UMass, I either lead or co-lead a couple of projects for the state of Massachusetts, the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, one on lead in schools and early education and care facilities, and the other on uh, the topic that's called PFAS. And um, so that, which is a new regulation in our drinking water. So in that role, I sometimes am wearing different kinds of hats, but they're both about public health and about uh, water quality. And so uh, the town of Amherst appears on lists of things that, I, <laughs> that I'm seeing, lists of what, who's participated in what and whatever, or may not appear. So there's intersections that are outside of this role of serving on this board. So sometimes I'm wearing different hats. So anyway, just wanted you to be aware, be aware of that if you... <laughs> hear of these programs or have questions or something I can maybe uh, help out. Some of those, the school stuff intersects more with the schools than with the town as, and those two are entities are have some difference between them, but, and overlap. Thank you. So as a board, we have to vote Emma in as an agent of the board. Um, so we need a uh, motion. Does anyone want to make a motion? I'll, I'll move that uh, Emma, Emma Dragon, uh, who's the health director of the town of Amherst, be an agent of the Board of Health. Second. Second. I second that motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. John. Oh, Tim. Tim is an aye. Aye. Maureen? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Nancy, I. So it's unanimous. Welcome as our agent, Emma. Thank you so much. Okay, next is the Kern Center, the composting toilet update. John, I certainly hope you've seen all this stuff. Well, I've seen it. I'm not as on top of it as I should have been. I'm sorry, I've been on Zoom calls almost the entire day and I, <laughs> and I have not... Uh, but I did, and surprisingly, Chris Chamberlain sent me an email to my UMass address that I forwarded to the board members. And I asked if anybody could, forward, it was right before the meeting, could forward to Emma and Jen, because I had not um, seen those. But uh, I see Chris and Claire and Sarah uh, joining in here. So right. um, I have uh, I looked at those and I'm aware of that. So um, I guess, I don't know what the exact order of things are, but that's up to you, Nancy. I don't know who, who speaks what, when. Uh, I'm not sure. So let's see who signed the letter. I think Sarah has is on the letter. Correct. Let me look here. Whoops. I got it out of order. No, it's Claire. So Claire, do you want to speak first? Hi. Uh, I think, can you guys hear me but not see me? Yes. Okay. We well, that's fine. Um, I'm going to 
pass to Chris. We're just uh, Chris can talk. <laughs> and, and folks, for the purposes of the minutes, could you introduce yourselves and say what your title is uh, so we get it straight? Hi, yes, I'm Claire Shillington and I am the RW Crone Center Coordinator at Hampshire College. Right, okay. Oh no, I think I messed up. Uh, oh, no, they're there. Now we'll be able to see them. Okay, yeah. I, we got kicked out for a second and then popped right back in, I think. I know, I got nervous. <laughs> no, I, I wanted to change you to panelists so we could see all of you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, I will also just introduce myself before Chris starts speaking. Um, I'm Sarah Draper. I'm the director of the RW Current Center at Hampshire. Um, and I'm Chris Chamberlain. I'm a civil engineer with Berkshire Design Group in Northampton um, and was responsible for designing the uh, net zero water systems at the Kern Center. Um, and so this is actually revisiting uh, something that we came to you folks uh, with in, I think, February, just before uh, all kinds of events happened, um, but to recap, um, the Kern Center uh, was constructed with Clivus composting toilets in lieu of traditional toilets as part of the net zero water systems um, in pursuit of something called the Living Building Challenge. Um, and part of that uh, composting toilet system um, includes composters in the basement that, uh, that collect waste and allow them to compost uh, into uh, more inert organic matter. Uh, the building has been open since 2016 and to date solid material has not been removed from the composting toilets. Um, the liquid uh, component, which is primarily urine, uh, which, which we sometimes refer to as leachate, is periodically uh, pumped into a holding tank in the basement and removed currently by a septage hauler and taken to a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and so what we're here uh, today is to talk about uh, the end uh, destination of the compost material. The composters are starting to get to the point where solid material needs to be removed. They are not at that point just yet, um, but we wanna get ahead of this. And actually I wanna, I wanna start by just uh, talking about the regulatory basis for all of this and also admit that for years, I was misinterpreting or misreading what Title V says on, on this issue. Um, but just to, to recap, so Title V, uh, the state uh, septic regulations, as you know, um, allows for composting toilets. And within the provisions of 15.289, uh, it says that uh, the system shall be designed to store compostable and composted solids for at least two years unless otherwise approved by the department. Uh, clearly, we, we met that with our design, which is great. And then talking about the residuals from the system, meaning the solid compost, residuals from the system shall be disposed of either by burial on site or in another manner and location approved by the local approving authority covered with a minimum of six inches of clean compacted earth. Um, the impression that I was under in February and for years before that was that it needed to be buried on site as approved by the, approved, uh, by the local approving authority, in this case, the Board of Health. It's actually that Title V allows for the burial or by another manner um, um, allowable by the Board of Health. Um, I am not saying that because we are looking to exempt ourselves from your approval. We very much want your consent to do this. Um, but just to point out that uh, DEP, uh, ha in their official opinion, uh, has determined that this method of disposal is safe and protective of human health and the environment. Um, and so that what we are uh, really asking you is uh, whether you object to us following Title V. Um, back in February, when we talked about this, John raised a very important point, which was um, the fact that we are not, strictly speaking, under standard, standard Title V regulations on this site because uh, a public sewer is available and therefore we were not permitted to just build a traditional septic system and use that for disposal of our wastewater. Instead, we used other provisions of Title V to pursue a pilot program for, um, for the uh, use of the composting toilets, as well as uh, treatment on site and disposal of gray water. Uh, that was approved by DEP. Uh, we got a letter of support from you folks uh, to pursue that um, and have constructed and are operating that pilot program system. 
Um, and so we inquired to DEP uh, to clarify whether the, those rules that I just quoted uh, from Title V are applicable in this case where we are under a pilot program and not a standard system. Um, we, I, I apologize, we got that answer back in May uh, and didn't forward it at the time. And so in the shuffle, it got uh, uh, set aside, but I did uh, make sure that that was sent to John. I think Sarah may have uh, uh, sent it also earlier today and it sounds like it's been circulated to the board. Um, I'm also happy to share my screen and show it, but uh, essentially uh, DEP, after reviewing the approval that they issued for our system, determined that yes, in fact, the uh, provisions for disposal that I just uh, read to you do apply uh, in the case of this pilot program. So essentially, DEP's opinion is that we are allowed to uh, bury these solids on site. Um, uh, some other issues that came up in February that we were asked to look into a little bit further. Um, one was to uh, test the compost material so the board could have a better understanding of what exactly we were dealing with. Um, and so uh, after some discussion about what standard we'd test them to, uh, we did send samples of the compost material for testing as compared to EPA standard for land application of class A biosolids. I wanna pause there and point out that what we're proposing is not actually land application, but burial. Um, but regardless, we did yeah. test against that standard. Um, we've sent those results in and you know, the things that I'll highlight is of course, you know, first significantly uh, fecal coliform was below the detection level of, of the uh, testing. Um, so I think that's certainly the, the most important result. Um, and then the, the remaining factors that we tested for were below uh, the EPA thresholds for that land application with one exception, uh, which was copper. And that I wanna talk about just very briefly um, because this was not actually a surprising result to us uh, with that initial result that we got. Um, the history of these composters is that uh, the spec for the composting units that went into the basement included stainless steel plumbing for the pump and discharge line that removes that liquid component and sends it to the storage tank. The plumber trying to be proactive, save a little money, put a better quality product in, whatever the case may have been, installed copper piping in that uh, highly aggressive environment. And within about four months, it sprung a leak um, because some of that copper corroded uh, into the compost mass. Uh, that was immediately swapped out. We've had stainless steel components in there since that time and have not had a similar problem. So when we got that result, uh, we decided to retest from a different location in the composter where we felt uh, that the compost would not have been impacted by that incident. And those results, we found uh, levels for copper that were below uh, what the, the EPA maximum would be for land application. Um, so on, on, in that regard, uh, we feel like the, the test results sort of speak for themselves and, and back up, again, DEP's um, sort of determination uh, that this is an appropriate uh, uh, means of disposal. And then finally, um, we had presented um, a layout uh, proposal where we would bury those, um, the, uh, the compost um, outside of the Kern Center um, between a couple of sidewalks. I, I can pull up the, uh, the plan if we wanna look at it again. And there was some concern about placing that immediately next to the sidewalks uh, with the possibility that uh, soil could get uh, uh, removed uh, through erosion or abrasion or whatever else. And we could uh, lose some of that six inch cover that the regulations require leading to an inadvertent expo exposure. Uh, we certainly heard that. Um, there were also questions just uh, asking us to think about uh, the location and destination of, of these solids in terms of the long-term. Um, you know, we, we continue to feel like a prominent burial location, certainly for this first batch near the building that we can add educational signage to, to help people understand what is going on is something that we want to pursue. Uh, if there's a strong objection to that, uh, you know, we can certainly find a more out of the way place uh, Camp Shure is not short of land uh, in order to do that, uh, but we're certainly willing to commit to an offset of, you know, we'd, we'd suggest two feet minimum from the edge of the sidewalk to alleviate those sort of uh, 
practical concerns about uh, accidentally uncovering this. And we're certainly strongly committed to, to putting signage up, not just for public health and safety, but also because we want people to, to understand um, uh, what this building is doing. Um, and that was our memory from those many months ago uh, of uh, what your questions were. Although if I missed anything, we're certainly happy to talk to that. Um, essentially, we put this on the back burner because the building was primary, was mostly shut down for the spring and the summer. And, and this was not really a pressing matter, uh, but mm. school's back in session and uh, time, to, time to get back into it. John and Tim, do you have questions? Um, I, I don't really have um, questions. It's interesting and, and great that you found that the Title V by, by giving a permit under Title V uh, designates that composting toilet uh, residuals can be buried on, on site by, by definition, by, by permit. And that's, that, that was interesting to me for this case in particular. Um, but despite that, I think uh, what we requested was reasonable and your uh, actions in response are, are excellent. Um, I think uh, getting some data on it, class A biosolids is about the closest thing you could compare to. Uh, that's a reasonable choice. Um, so to me, it seems uh, really excellent that you have that information. In other words, uh, if I built a composting toilet and it was approved by Title V, no one would make a measurement of what I buried on site, but you've got some measurements of what going to be uh, uh, used there. Um, and the copper uh, high on one sample and not another is, is, I think the median average, it's all going to be mixed together. Uh, it's not a concern from my perspective. I know it's also really bound tightly to all those organics. And uh, the reason it's not absent from other parts of it, in case everybody doesn't realize, we all require a significant amount of copper as an essential nutrient. We excrete it. <laughs> I mean, all humans do. We take it in and we, and we use our body use it and we excrete it. Lead is not the case. That's another story. We don't want any lead. We don't need any lead. Uh, but we do need copper and we do excrete it. So it will never be non-detect in case you were wondering about that. It's, it, there's, a, there's copper's pretty ubiquitous in, uh, in places. So um, to me, everything you propose makes sense. I think the setback from the sidewalks and the educational stuff. So I don't think we have to take action, actually. We don't have a role to take action because it's permitted under the permit. But if others interpret it differently, I, I'm, I don't know. Tim, Tim, or, anyone, Tim or anyone uh, else? Um, I'm not clear, you know. Uh, so if it's, it's allowed, what, what is the role of the Board of Health, you know? Is it going to be an opinion or? I'm just not clear about that, you know. Uh, I think well, it's we, more, yeah. So I think initially we approached under the understanding that we needed your approval, um, and and having raised the flag, we certainly didn't want to disappear and just go do this on our own. Um, so I guess that that we are advising the Board of Health that that we are going to follow Title V and pursue this. And if the Board of Health has an objection, um, and certainly uh, DEP also pointed out that. Um, that a regulation could be adopted holding us to a higher or different standard. Um, but uh, in the absence of any action like that, um, I, I think that your silence on the issue is good enough for us. But if you feel the need to, to take an action, then, then that, that's your prerogative. So a couple of, uh, this is my opinion, uh, but you know, it might help maybe uh, improve your standards or whatever it is. So one thing, if I could remember, uh, in the first meeting, and I believe in February, we had high fecal coliform, or is that is that correct? Uh, in the in the tested, we didn't uh, have any not. sludge. We didn't have any sludge, uh, sludge examination. Okay. Yeah. Right, so, we had some some data that had been gathered by the manufacturer on on, right. on the site. So in this case, we have testing of of the actual material that that we have on site. Right. Uh, I mean, this this uh, this testing is. Uh, it's much better in terms of the sample, you know, there's no uh, fecal uh, contamination. Um, so a couple of things. One is, um, uh, of course, you know, you are legally allowed to bury on site. Um, but uh, one thing is uh, risk management, you know, because you're an institution, you know, educational institution. Um, if there is some sort of a occasional spike in something, you know, because this was not anticipated, copper was not anticipated or, uh, 
uh, there might be other type of uh, things, you know. So one thing is it might be helpful for you to have some sort of a contingency plan, you know. Um, if, if something goes wrong in the design or something down the road, what are some of the ways you can actually handle it? So that is one thing. Um, another one is, um, I know it is uh, the primary purpose of uh, burying it next to, you know, um, next to the building is primarily the, for educating the educating students and educating visitors and all those things, which is a very important uh, role. But also, uh, if there are sites which are a little bit uh, away from the sidewalk, like not two feet, but maybe a little bit uh, away, it might, you can still have signage leading to that, say you can just visit, visit this place. That might help in terms of uh, uh, potential exposure and contamination or runoff or whatever it is coming out of it. So this is just my opinion, since Board of Health is not uh, uh, going to actually allow or uh, permit or anything because it's, we are just, uh, uh, I'm just pro providing the opinion to help you uh, plan in the future. Thank you. Steve or Maureen, do you have any comments? Here's one quick question, just out of curiosity. Is it going to be like a raised bed? So the, the sludge is going to be, or the, you know, the, the fecal material is going to, the compost is going to be below ground and then there's six inches of soil on top of the raised bed, or is it going to end up at ground level? Um, I, uh, I think the intention is not a formal raised bed, um, although uh, having the ground high there, I think would be expressive in a way that would that would be beneficial to to uh, creating a, a thing. Um, you know, the the idea is is a mulched ornamental planting bed so that there's a clear demarcation. Uh, the, the issue with the raised bed is now if that that raised bed is our six inches of soil, are, do we have less than six inches of cover um, around the edges? So, so that would give me a little hesitation to do something quite so um, sure. deliberate. Sure. Thanks. I mean, I can also just speak to that. Um, the other the other planting areas on the site all at least have some kind of border. It's not necessarily a raised bed above ground level, but it's a border to prevent the soil from moving around. Um, I would anticipate that we would at the very least do that. Sure. Um, and then as we put the, the bed in, the site that it's on has a, an ever so slight slope. So we may need to put a higher border on one side anyway, just to structural for structural integrity. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm looking at Google Maps right now at, at the site. I mean, you got a lot of open area uh, south and, and, and uh, east of the site as opposed to the north and west where the rain, the, the, the collection, you know, the, the depressed and the plantings are. I mean, why not? You got a lot of room to work with that's a lot more than two feet away from a, a sidewalk. So it seems like you got plenty of plenty of places to go that, that have got good soil areas around them. Demark it, you can sign it and note that this is... Um, good soil amendment nutrients for for this so that's fair yeah yeah, yeah. Our, our choice of that site was the lar largely based on the fact that grass doesn't grow as well there so we figured it would be a really good place to put a planting bed. um but yeah. i appreciate your your feedback on we do have a lot of space yeah about how many cubic yards will come out of the two composters what is it about 20 gallons i think uh. <laughs> yeah it's nothing Right. It's, it's, it's not, large. yeah, it's not a large yeah. amount. No, it's, it's, uh, I just wanted to point that out. It's very small. Yeah. yeah. And again, that's after about four and a half years of operation. Mm -hmm. You know, as uh, I don't know what towns have dealt with this, but uh, you know, we're always updating regulations here. We've been dealing with a lot of different things, but if we do more um, humanure type approaches or on site, um, uh, fecal matter disposal, uh, which I'm very much in favor of, but only works under certain circumstances. It'll be interesting to see if towns need to address that. So it's allowed under compost toilet on Title uh, Title Five, but um, I wonder if we have any composting toilets in use uh, in single home residences in Amherst. I actually don't know that. Maybe Ed does. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, they would be a title. We don't have that many Title Five systems left in Amherst. We're about 95% sewer, so we don't really come up. But it's an interesting question. Anyway. Hmm. I'll comment that I shot one down last year. Oh yeah, really? Because <laughs> it had access to sewer 
Ed, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it had the side by side um, systems. Uh, it was the, basically just a sawdust and bucket operation, but it involved um, rental housing. Oh, so yeah, homeowner who had tenants in the house. Now, is that the one on Beston Street? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and that was a very cooperative uh, remedy there. There was no hard feelings. And yeah, yeah. It really went well. Yeah. We last talked this in earnest when, where I live about 20 years ago, folks, neighbors, they were in South Amherst, wanted to, instead of sewering, do alternative on-site whatever things. And I guess my, my protect public health and interrupt the fecal oil route hat was a lot stronger than, than the, the cool notion of what works. So people are lousy at maintaining anything. So uh, yeah, you guys are an institution and you're teaching and it's, it's really a great application of, of showing this. I have one question. Um, I know that there is a water body downslope to the from that location. I'm just curious, how far is it? Like maybe 200, 300 feet? Or I was just looking at uh, GIS uh, maps. You know, I mean, there is one near the as you come in the main entrance of campus. Um, I think that's the closest. Is it like a wetland or a forested wetland? Or um, there is a Boy, there's nothing. Oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. That um, so down, down slope, you know. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, yeah. The little bridge is over it when you walk over from the red barn. Um, so one yeah. option to think about is to have some buffer strip, as Sarah was mentioning. You know, have a buffer strip downslip of it so that any runoff or anything can prevent going into that. It's not it's a public health issue, there. but it's it's still something to think about in the design. Yeah. Sure, and, and I will note that um, the entirety of the site runs to rain gardens within the site uh, yeah. as a first step, uh, which then infiltrate uh, unless they're overwhelmed by a very heavy rain. Um, and, and then from there, um, overflow goes to the campus road system and is, is collected in the, in the storm drains. Yep. Hey. Any other comments? Well, thank you, Chris, Claire, and Sarah. And lots of luck as you progress with this wonderful project. Thank you. Thanks very much. Welcome. OK. Yeah, thanks for informing us. <clears throat> so next on the agenda is 289 East Hadley Road, emergency condemnation. So are you going to be addressing that, Ed? Yeah, I can give you a, just a brief update. The homeowner actually did not request a hearing before the board. Um, because I took the action about a week and a half ago, I wanted to make sure at least was on the agenda so that if we needed to use this time for that purpose, that it would be there and it would be relatively easy. Um, this is a, a person, a senior who I worked with about five years ago. Um, and actually she was in open recognition that she had a problem. She you know, definitely had um, an issue with ac acquisition and uh, retention of too much stuff of many descriptions. Um, and she did quite a bit of voluntary um, cleanup there. There weren't formal orders involved. Um, I came to the house actually under a different question and we ended up striking a relationship and we were able to just, I would visit and check on progress and encourage. And um, she had improved quite a bit and then had a cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm probably giving too much information, but at any rate, she was quite open about that. And um, voluntarily we stepped back from that. But this came to a head um, a Sunday, a week and a half ago, when the fire department called from the scene and they were assisting um, and noting that the condition of the house was, um, was bad uh, for egress, um, for fire load, for um, just having access to the things that one needs in a habitable situation. And I was able to, using their pictures, um, actually decide that this deserved to be 
a subject of an emergency condemnation. So I did that and I forwarded the information to the hospital, letting them know that it was not fit for um, releasing her to. Um, and they actually collated things and it's been very cooperative in situations like that. Um, I think if I give them what they need, um, they are, I mean, they print up the orders and, and actually deliver them to the patient for me, um, which helps a tremendous amount. I also send it legally to the house, but that doesn't really inform the person. So she's in, she's at this time fully cooperating. She's in rehab um, and family and or church members, a community, in other words, are pledging to help. And I have to keep monitoring that and see that it actually happens. So this time there's, there isn't a need for a hearing or board involvement. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for your tact and handling yeah. that. Well, well first, this went better than many, so. Yeah, we've had a few uh, like that. And so there's conditions that could result that would allow this order to be lifted actions that can be taken. Yeah, I'm anticipating that probably what we'll realistically do um, is leave part of the house condemned, which I believe can be done. Um, and I'll make sure of that. But um, it's, um, it's a split level ranch. Uh, essentially, a daughter or a niece had an apartment downstairs. And we're tentatively planning towards working towards her being able to live out of that area of the house. Um, so we'll provide living space, a bathroom, an area for, realistically, she's heating food. She's not really extensively cooking, which is what I would prefer, is that mm -hmm. she's not trying to cook until the place is really cleaned out. Um, and it's not actually very much different than the lifestyle that she's been leading just without the mess, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And then do you have the uh, Lincoln Real Estate, Catherine Calaverly, is that how you pronounce her name? Uh, question regarding light variance and the housing code. Is that you, Ed, too? Yes. Okay. And, and we're still tossing that back and forth. It's much like the other situation where she first, Lincoln Real Estate first brought this proposal a week or 10 days ago. Um, Lincoln is working with the building commissioner. Um, this space, this is um, where the, I don't know if I have the name right, the fire and water yoga studio. Or, it was in the alley near where the Thai restaurant used to be. Kind of oh, next, okay. next next to the lit restaurant bar. We go through that little little walk through. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Next to Antonio. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Be yeah. Near yeah. That. The back of Antonio's. So the back in the back there. Okay. Well, that space has an abundance of showers. It turns out, and there's discussion currently about whether that might be tied in with use for the the shelter downtown. Um, and while well, that gets hashed out anyway, Lincoln has been trying to find a tenant, a commercial tenant. It's a difficult space. Um, and they're thinking of just converting it to an apartment. Um, there are questions about, is there enough natural light? Is there enough natural ventilation? How many apartments could they, or how many bedrooms could they make in there? So they didn't have something that I thought was proposable. Um, so we're, we're going back and forth, but it's not under the time deadline that I thought it might be. So maybe we'll have something in a month or two. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's all the new business. Thank you, Ed. Welcome. Okay, so topics not anticipated by the chair. Um, I just want to and I'll forward all this to everybody but the um, because it's the health department's mission is based on the essential public health services 
They had been updated the end of September, beginning of October. And I became, I knew they were updating it. And at the APHA meeting, I became aware of the update. So I'll just send it out. And um, they've changed it from assessment policy development, promotion and assurance to assessment policy development and insurance with the core being equity. And I'll just send this document out to people. And I don't know if Emma, you wanna look at it um, because it's the foundation of the mission of the health department, not the board of health. And I just thought I would tell you about it and send it out. There's really nothing for discussion, but I thought you'd like to see the update there. They were 25 years old before they were updated and they were just updated by the CDC and the, the Beaumont Foundation uh, with guidance from the Public Health Association Accreditation Board uh, nationally. So it was just an FYI. And then we will have the director's report. <laughs> Oh, so it's my first director's report seven days in. <laughs> <laughs> so um, of the information that I've been able to gather and experience, there's that dog again, um, in the last seven days, uh, working with Craig's Place has been a large part of the, my time. Um, Kevin and I have frequently communicated with each other. Um, I have visited both sites, the UU and the UML, more than once on each time. And Kevin has been very open with um, submitting the management plan. He has been receptive to suggestions that I had regarding that management plan. It's a, it's a fairly good plan um, and it was a great start, but certainly with COVID, additional areas with health and safety um, kind of guidelines and protocols that they're using, uh, I thought would be very helpful. Um, we do have an agreement with Dr. Bossy where she's gonna be uh, performing testing every four weeks on, at, um, at Craig's Place. And while I don't think that is the goal that I have for us testing the guests that are coming and, and the change in population that we'll see there, uh, I think it's a great start. Um, I know that there's this further discussions about additional testing, possibly coordinated with UMass, but I think this is a really great start. I wanted to secure at least having that as testing right now and be able to problem solve additional testing moving forward. Um, Jennifer Brown recently had two flu clinics, um, if you want to call them that, <laughs> Jen. Uh, one was uh, outside of Craig's Place at the UU, and the second was held at the Amherst Survival Center. Um, out, both of them were outside. We received uh, clients at both of those. Um, State funding that was previously secured through grant monies um, had not yet been submitted to the state for Amherst. So I was able to work with um, and get that submitted today for the state application for those funds to support flu uh, clinics and equipment and other resources that we might need. Um, and then kind of delving into influenza and vaccine, vaccination and clinics. Um, I also had a great opportunity of meeting up with Lauren Devine from the Hampshire Preparedness um, Coalition for Emergency Preparedness and do a site visit of our outdoor emergency dispensing site, which will be at right now at, as it's planned at Amherst Regional High School in the parking lot as a drive-through. Uh, my goal um, is to have a, a outdoor flu clinic there so we can try to use it as a, a practice run, if you will, 
um, for the, when the time does come that we have COVID vaccine to do a widespread activity to really engage our CERT team, use the MRC, possibly UMass nursing students, um, have it and, and problem solve from there. One of the challenges uh, with a, the COVID vaccine is that we do have to have an observation period where cars will stay parked for 15 minutes after receiving the vaccine, because this will be the first time that any of us are receiving a vaccine. So to make sure that that's being administered safely, that's the guidelines that, that have been given to us. Um, we're also working on securing a new refrigerator for vaccines that'll help have a five day generator um, in case there's an emergency of power outage that'll be wheeled. So working on that. And um, then in terms of COVID status and where our community is, as of this morning, we had 91 active cases. Um, I know Stephen, was it you or was it John that sent the, the table to the group with the, the total number of cases? I said that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was great. Um, and certainly cases are gonna go up as we see testing increase in terms of the cumulative count of cases. One thing that I like to focus on is the active number of cases because people recover following that time. Um, our data that came out just at the beginning of this meeting, um, showed that Am the town of Amherst has an uh, average daily incidence of 14.4 and a positivity rate of 0.34. Um, I just wanna highlight that that is incredibly low. Um, I know that there's concerns about the college data somehow skewing our results. Um, I know that's something that Department of Higher Ed, Ed has looked at and so that our data will be top notch. Um, and, oh, I don't have share screen, but one of the things that DPH did do last week, which I think people might've heard feedback about is change the parameters for the color mapping and yeah. change the, the color mapping and the, and the map that will be sent out in terms of risk level of communities. Um, I think there was unintended stigma mm -hmm. that was being experienced against color uh, communities with a higher risk point. Um, and certainly the red and the kind of static metrics created an alarmed community. I think a community that really wants to be engaged in public health, I think people are confused and anxious um, and want information, but it's being able to give out thoughtful, clear information that's based in science. So um, that's what I have for the director's report. I hope that's okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Emma? It does seem like the number that's the increase in the number over the past two weeks is the most mm -hmm. rapid increase since the pandemic began. Yes. How are you guys doing on contact tracing? Are you doing it locally or involving the state with that? So that's a great question. So it's really a partnership. I think Jen, Jen Brown, I, is she's still on the call listening and I know she'll key in if I, I misspeak. Um, and certainly I'm just saying kind of what's been onboarded to me so far. So for cases that originate from Amherst residents that are not students of the University of Massachusetts are done primarily by Jen Brown. We do engage the CTC, that state, the contact tracing collaborative, sometimes as an adjunct when needed, but the primary amount of contact tracing is done by Jen. Um, that's, that engagement of the CTC is also experienced if sometimes if it's a, a like an employer or an establishment. Um, and really kind of the intersection of the UMass contact tracing staff uh, and, and, and Jennifer Brown and um, I lost it, that WISP. 
Does that ever happen to anybody else? That <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so local contact tracers, the public health nurses, the university, and the CTC, it can get kind of jumbled sometimes, right? Our hairs can get crossed in terms of like who's on first. I know those are kinks that in, in another, in my other town we're experiencing as well that we're trying to iron out and really engage the, the stockholders, if you will, um, to try and better it. Uh, I did have a meeting with Ann Becker this week to try and work on that. Um, certainly since we're gonna have an increased population of students this spring, I know that I am probably in a room of, of like-minded people where I want our community to be best prepared as we can with a clear identified plan that we can execute and adjust if needed, but to identify those contacts quickly um, and be able to keep our community safe. Yeah. Any other questions? And also, I think it's a really good. Me, I think it's a really good thing to have COVID nineteen on the agenda. Even though, of course, we're going to talk about it, but just in terms of how the report appears to the public, um, I think it's very good to have it listed as part of the director's report until we're safe, till we're, till it's over. As as it was this time, so that's good. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be a present discussion for quite a bit. Um, I think it's, I know it's hard that we're saying the same kind of messaging, but it truly is kind of a marathon. We're at the kind of end of the first part of COVID. Um, but I think public health for quite a bit will be in the light of the public view. And I'm, well, I'm sad that it took a pandemic for us to be visible because um, usually public health is kind of the quiet in the background um, piece. I'm, I'm happy that we're at least being seen. Sorry, Maureen, I interrupted That's you. That's quite all right. I was getting uh, ahead of myself. Um, I just wondered with your insights are in terms of how what types of contexts are, how is this spreading now? Um, you know, initially, you know, with the, with the, in, in the town, there was an event that seemed to cause a, a blip. Is, is that still an event related? Are these still event related clusters or is this seeming to have a different uh, way of spreading through different groups in the community? So I think that's a great question. Um, I, our, what I have heard and seen is that these are still related to small, those small groups of events, um, whether they were small gatherings or Halloween related at this point. The primary amount of data from the state shows that 88% of transmission for COVID is happening in small, in households and small gatherings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when we, our friend, we might think we'll just meet up with our friend inside just for a couple minutes, just say hi. Um, people, it's, that's when people are letting their guard down, unfortunately. So um, it's really just kind of re bringing back, of course, my home phone is ringing now. This is funny. Um, <laughs> It, for me, it's revisiting the messaging that we're having with our community. I think one of the challenges with where we are in the pandemic and part of why my, I feel that the governor revisited the orders and the mandates that are out there is we are all very tired of the mandates and the challenges that it's having on our everyday life. And by making these new orders, trying to get ahead of the curve, and then also making us more cognizant of what we're doing because of the mandates, hopefully it'll be able to manage and mitigate transmission and a big surge in Massachusetts. So revisiting messaging, Maureen, um, 
is definitely something I'm excited to do with Brianna as part of that. And, and, and using the tools that the local board of health um, that Ron O'Connor and his team and Jana Ferguson really helped develop with the academic at, um, public health schools. They have some really great visuals um, and even some interns that right now on day seven, I, I don't have the capacity to engage, but I, I am really eager to do so once I have the, once we have the capacity. I just want to thank Jennifer. If you go into the um, health department's website and go into COVID, she has the Thanksgiving piece up and the governor's new orders up. So she really keeps all of that up to date for townspeople who may want to go in and, and get some education. So yeah. thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, it's great. I wanted to ask a question of Jen, Jennifer, maybe if she's, uh, we're, we haven't heard her voice, but she must be listening. We hope yeah. you are. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey. Yes. Hey, um, for Jennifer and Emma is, um, uh, I know the town uh, was in the paper a while back. There was a reach out to engage uh, with UMass and the town to uh, first responders uh, get asymptomatic testing at the Mullen Center. And I'm wondering if you can comment on how much of that has occurred or what do you know about that? Emma, you may have more information than I do. I, I know it has been used by first responders. Um, there, some are going in every week um, and uh, some people are not using it, but they feel very assured and um, supported by the town knowing it's there if there was an incident, so. Okay, so you don't have statistics on use? I don't have them. Yeah, yeah. okay. I don't have them right now, but I could possibly get back to you with that. I mean, I think it'd be interesting to know how many police and fire uh, officials are, are, you know, people mm -hmm. in town are have gone and made use of that op yeah. that opportunity, is the yeah. way I to put it. Um, yeah, I know. I, I I'm doing that. I'm doing weekly testing, and I, I I love it when that email comes in. Another negative test. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not a call from somebody like Jennifer. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that was one question I hadn't, I don't know if either of you can advocate for the following and I haven't reached out, but I know in looking at the statistics at the UMass data, I'd like to see the, another breakdown. They have a lot of breakdown, a lot of data, but I'd be curious to see of the positives, how many are from uh, just in, in a cumulative manner, asymptomatic versus symptomatic. I kind of get it because I look every time when they're there and I go look at the, the basis, but <laughs> it's just, it'd be an interesting metric to see just give you a sense. I mean, maybe it's not that it doesn't have any value per se, but what percent of of uh, positives are we capturing via the asymptomatic versus symptomatic? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Both both definitely are there, but um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's it's great, and to any extent I'll, <laughs> that UMass can extend its uh, arm to more townspeople, uh, the better. <laughs> uh, so, it's question. Great. Well, sorry, John. Nope. Um, the ambassadors, I see them. Um, I, I've talked to them, and I see them on Friday late afternoon evenings and Saturdays, walking up down Lincoln and into the Phillips Street area to sort of see what's happening with parties. Um, have you gotten any feedback from how the ambassadors? They seem to be a, doing a great job. Um, have you heard about any feedback from them? Emma or Jen? I know that I haven't had any direct feedback from them, but I do know in the most recent COVID uh, leadership meeting that I was on, there was very good um, that they continue to be engaged and reaching out to the community and generally are very, very well received, um, have continued to kind of identify those areas Nancy, like you're describing, that might have been reported on the party report um, site. I'm probably using the wrong language, but um, they do also try to reach other areas. Uh, they have various shifts, and I know that they continue to try to do their work. Yeah, I've been impressed with what I've seen from them. I think it's a model that would be great in other lo local towns too. And I'm glad that they have them in Northampton as well. 
Any other comments before we adjourn? Oh, I just had a follow-up question on Craig's door and the, and the homeless shelter and stuff. It was, I think there was a nice an article in the paper that funding came in for for perhaps some hospital or hotel beds to you know to be used for additional shelter space. There was an article in the paper. Is that moving? It was about Craig's doors potentially the getting a funding to make use of maybe university lodge beds or something. Am I? I believe they to... are using university lodge. I think they have. 18 beds there. Do you know, Emma, the number of beds they have at University Lodge? Yep, it's 20 beds. 20 beds. Great. That's great that they have that. Yeah. But they have a capacity of, of 20 of the 20 beds at the University Motor Lodge and the 14 at the University Universalist at the UU. That's a total of 34 beds, which is even higher than they've had on previous years. I think that's really extraordinary um, that we're able to house that you know, put a roof over those many people's heads and help provide them meals and coordinate their care um, with Craig's place, so. I have another question, Emma or, or Jen. Have you been involved in the letters and the push for the state to open up a quarantine isolation hotel or place out here for um, people without permanent homes? Because the only one is in Everett. Um, which is that is home. yeah that is correct Nancy the only shelter for the state right now is, for the Q and I is in Everett um, I know that lots of our local legislatures mm -hmm. Mindy Dome um, Joe Comerford and I'm probably those are the two that come to my mind right away are trying to work actively on that I know that I am verbalizing the need whenever the time is available and the moment is right. Um, and we're trying to demonstrate that need for that additional place out in Western Mass, not an hour away each way. Um, so I hope more to come with that. But we all we can do is keep trying. Okay. Thank you. Well, how many? Um... How many flu shots did you administer at those two clinics, Jen? I think it was a, a total of about 50. Yeah, spread out, yeah. Thank you, that's great. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Okay, can I have a motion to adjourn our meeting? I move we adjourn, adjourn our meeting. <laughs> Second. second, I can I'll second, second it. <laughs> okay, now we have to have a roll call vote. John, aye. Jean, aye. Maureen, aye. Tim, aye. Nancy, aye. Okay, we are adjourned. Great. Thank we like you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.